today we have an extra special opportunity to uh, hear something about Bob Hendren's more recent work. But I just mentioned to Bob that the first time that I had met him was in July 1996 when he did one of the presentations at the International Association for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry meeting here in San Francisco that um, I was the organizing chair for at the time. Irving Phillips said that our previous director was president of the academy and unfortunately died of that before then. And so uh, we were continued with the meeting here in San Francisco. And Bob had uh, done a presentation on school consultation because he had just finished a one-year sabbatical at the World Health Organization in Geneva studying school consultation and school behavior uh, throughout the world. Uh, at the time, uh, Bob had his training uh, at the Mayo Clinic in psychiatry. He did his child psychiatry training at Yale with uh, Donald Cohen and uh, then had been at George Washington University, then at the um, uh, University of New Mexico, at Rutgers, at the Mind Institute. He came here to be our chief of child psychiatry about 12, 10 or 11 years, 12 years ago. And uh, he is now a professor uh, and involved with school consultation and these extra special problems that are occurring and learning in, uh, in school settings. Um, his co-presenter will be Stephanie Heft, who um, got her uh, degree at the Claremont Center and uh, is uh, applying to graduate school and working in uh, the labs here at the UCSF. Bob. Stephanie is going to kick it off. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be presenting with Dr. Hendren a bit about coexisting learning and emotional difficulties in schools. Uh, and share a bit about the research uh, that I do with Dr. Hendren and also with Dr. Kimiko Hink, um, and he's going to talk a bit as well. So um, first I'll give just a very brief snapshot overview of uh, learning difficulties, disorders, um, and then Dr. Hendren will talk about the work being done at the UCSF Dyslexia Center. Um, I'll give uh, an overview of some of the research uh, that we're doing um, with LD and the socio-emotional impacts. And then Dr. Hendren will kind of conclude talking about the different comorbidities that occur um, and also interventions and treatment. Uh, so these are just some snapshots of numbers. Um, on kind of the higher end, it's estimated that uh, 30 to 50 percent of the population might have undiagnosed learning disabilities. 27% um, of children with learning disabilities drop out of high school. Um, and then the largest kind of comorbidity, uh, which Dr. Hendren will talk more about, is ADHD, which about one third of children um, who have learning disabilities also have ADHD. Uh, so we're using kind of a variety of terminologies here, learning disorders, dyslexia, uh, learning differences. Um, so I'll kind of be referring to these all as LD. Um, the reason for this is that dyslexia is, um, makes up the largest proportion of learning disorders. Um, and then there's been kind of a push in some fields to label these or call these more learning differences uh, because of the stigma associated with the word disorders. Um, so in kind of all those terminologies, I'll try to clarify, but um, I'll refer to them as LD. But talking about specifically dyslexia, um, it's a problem with phonological awareness or matching uh, letters that you see on the page to sounds and combining uh, the sounds that those letters make. Um, and so, as you can imagine, trouble with this step means that all other steps after that, such as fluency and comprehension, are all the more difficult. Um, an important thing about dyslexia is that it's unexpected, given a child's uh, IQ and adequate schooling. 
Um, and a lot of uh, people and children with dyslexia uh, actually are very fast and creative thinkers and have strong reasoning abilities, but it's really this problem with phonological awareness. And so uh, this slide can be a little bit overwhelming, but uh, essentially uh, the strong message of this slide is uh, that reading is a very complex process. It's a skill that's uh, unique to humans, um, but if you do find a dog that can read, let me know. Uh, but so far, unique to humans, and it's evolutionarily a new skill. Uh, and so there's, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, kind of no time for one uh, dedicated brain circuit to evolve to handle reading. So instead, it borrows from kind of all these other skills, um, phonological awareness, uh, sensory motor integration, auditory processing, uh, more executive processes. Uh, and so with that, uh, with kind of combining all these different processes, there's a lot of different comorbidities which we'll be discussing, and some of them are listed here. Thanks, Stephanie. It's been uh, <clears throat> such a pleasure to work with Stephanie. She's really efficient, and she works really hard. The paper based on our talk has been under review for a while. We got to revise and submit, but it was a paper that she and Fumiko and Nancy Cushion White and I did together talking about <clears throat> this overlap between learning and reading disorders and uh, kind of an emotional comorbidity. I, as John mentioned, had been really interested in this and then spent the sabbatical. Uh, writing a monograph on mental health in schools that we then went around to different places, particularly in the Middle East, talking about <clears throat> the overlap and what happens when people have a difficult time learning to read, uh, whether there are emotional factors before that, and then we can certainly recognize emotional factors after that. When you think about a child, a young person that isn't learning to read and, and is trying to hide that, trying not to let others know, sometimes that doesn't get discovered until they're in the second or third grade, sometimes even later. I think uh, those of us as mental health professionals um, can at times overlook that comorbid reading or learning disorder, just as people in the school setting can often overlook the uh, emotional components to that, ADHD, anxiety disorder. And I don't think that there are like a Venn diagram kind of distinct things that are there separated, but they're things that weave in together and that we need to understand both to make the most effective kind of an intervention and in how we can do that. We also don't understand a lot about dyslexia. We are understanding increasingly that it's about, it's, an, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, but we used to say, oh, even when you were educated, oh yeah, it has to do with phonics, right? I have trouble saying that those little phonic expressions. And I think increasingly we're recognizing that there are a number of different ways that kids can have trouble learning how to read which has been what led to the origin of our dyslexia center here at UCSF. Uh, a person who was the, the chairman of a school for kids with dyslexia, Armstrong School in Belmont, has 250 students. And the chairman of the board came and said, why don't you start a, a program, uh, a research program, for people with dyslexia uh, and, and understand better? He said, I get reports back that don't, aren't meaningful to me and that parents say are not meaningful to them. And we're appreciating in some ways that we're not individualizing our treatment as well as we might. We're not personalizing it. So we've, we have a vision to use neuroscience to understand better how to phenotype or subtype the different kinds of reading difficulties people can have so that we can make a more personalized approach to what we're doing and do that based not on psychodynamics or um, the other things that I have felt more comfortable thinking about using. It's been a partnership with neurology and Bruce Miller and Mary, Gorn Mary Lou Gorner Tempini, thinking about, from their perspective, what are the cognitive processes? How do we understand what's the neural circuitry? What's the neurobiology between each of these particular components that might play a, a, a role and, and having a difficult time learning to read. We also said from the very beginning that we wanted this to be translational. If we 
<coughs> studied this in the laboratory, and it worked fine when we did MRI and different kinds of um, educational testing or computer-based testing or a neuropsych test, but it only worked in the laboratory. It didn't translate into something that could make a difference in the classroom. Then we weren't really accomplishing our mission. So we said our model is that we're going to have the phenotyping project, which Mary Lou heads, and is based to some extent on work that Bruce Miller did with frontotemporal dementia. And if some of you saw Mary Lou's Grand Rounds a couple months ago, or maybe six weeks ago, was an excellent Grand Rounds tracing her thinking and how that developed. And I'll tell you, I'll repeat some of what she said. But we do an outcome study at Armstrong School. We have been doing outcome studies at several schools. One at a school for children with autism in San Anselmo called Oak Hill School. Another uh, for kids with autism that are transition age youth that, at a place called Maristem Academy just outside Sacramento. And we're just now beginning to negotiate with a couple other schools for LD to have a a web-based outcome measure that parents and teachers participate in filling out about how a kid is doing and that is based in some ways on the phenotype that we've determined is key for this particular child from that phenotyping project. And then what Stephanie and, and uh, Fumiko and that group, or, or that whole group have been working on is how to take some of those phenotypes, those subtypes, those ways that we understand, and turn it into an app that could be used early for children, even before they're learning to read, to begin to identify, they might have difficulty learning to read, but to begin to identify what's the subtype so that we could better target what we're trying to look at. So Mary Lou, as I mentioned, does the phenotyping part of the project and looks at a number of different <coughs> parts of the brain going. <clears throat> so as Stephanie alluded to, reading is a very complex kind of interaction. It's not like walking, where there's a part of your brain that, that's mainly set up for walking, or you could even see a couple things that might play a role in it. When you are reading, you have the visual part of it, you have the phonics part of it, you have the learning and understanding. So many parts of the brain are involved. And to some extent, it's, we think of it as a left-sided brain problem, but we're increasingly recognizing that there are interactions between the left and the right and how that happens. So there's both of those things playing a role. We do um, fMRI tasks looking at uh, how people are learning and then do diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging that uh, we'll, we'll look at some other uh, images that help us see how the brain is connected and how that's working in each of these phenotypes. Uh, and this kind of repeats it, but with a little more uh, words about what we're saying. Each of these areas can play a role in learning how, in, in having a difficult time learning how to read. And people then uh, might benefit from one particular intervention and not from another and vice versa. But often in our schools, we have one type of intervention. Or people say, I'm going to go to Linda Mood Bell. And for many, it works great. And for some, it doesn't work at all. Or I'm going to try this or that approach. And we're thinking that if we are more sophisticated in identifying the phenotype, we could make a better kind of intervention. Mary Lou goes back and forth between six and eight different phenotypes. She finds uh, more evidence for some than for others. But as you imagine, you might have trouble learning to read because of your visual spatial processing. You know, how are you doing visually? Then there's an executive part that is not necessarily ADHD, but has to do more with working memory. And then there's a part that has more to do with ADHD that's part of it as well. Then there's the phonics based one, and that's one of the larger ones. But it's not just looking at phonics, the little parts of words. There are people that can have a hard time putting the whole loop together. So they may read a paragraph and read it fine, not having trouble uh, identifying how to say it phonologically. But at the end, when you say, what did you just say? What was the story in this paragraph? They didn't put those words together in a way that becomes understandable to them. They don't make the loop. And then there can be the visual and the phonological. How do you deal with that? There's probably um, one that has to do with auditory discrimination. 
you know, that comprehension that I mentioned. And as I say, Mary Lou changes around on some of these at different times, which is why I say preliminary, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time drilling way down. But we've done about 60 to 70 kids so far, and many or most of them are from Armstrong. So we have an outcome study that then goes to Armstrong and says, when we meet with the parents and we meet with the teachers and we tell them about this phenotype, is it making a difference in how the child's learning, how the child is doing in school? We also, are, in that way, are trying to get teachers to think differently about what's their intervention. This is kind of a mock-up. It's not anything that I would say this is the absolute truth. But you can see that for a uh, Linda Moo Bell type, they might do very well with phonological kinds of learning, but they wouldn't do so well for some of the others that are listed up there and vice versa. So if, if it's not a phonological issue, if it's the <coughs> linking the words, then they would need another kind of an intervention. And in those ways, we're trying to better differentiate how that works. Uh, just to give you an example, and I'm not going to drill down on these cases, but these are three kids that have dyslexia. All three kids are from Armstrong School. And you can see, it, it's barely see, the, um, the way they did on testing. So on nonverbal reading, uh, reasoning, all three of the kids were up above the 80th percentile in how they were doing. But when you look at phonology, you can see some here, some up here, phonological loop here, down here. And as you go on across each of those areas, the, the neuropsych testing can begin to differentiate and show that there are strengths and there are weaknesses, and yet all these kids carry a diagnosis of dyslexia. We also find that that uh, holds up when we look at uh, the diffusion tensor imaging that is a little more experimental, and while we can't say with great assuredness, we can see if you look at the, the colored connections, you can see a big difference here and here from one side of the brain to the other in how a kid's doing. They should be relatively equal or a little bit asymmetrical, but not that asymmetrical. And you can see other asymmetries based on the difficulty that the child was having, what their brain connections are like. Then we measure their outcomes in this school <coughs> setting, and that's the part that our team um, uh, works on. And I don't know if Tracy is here, but Tracy has been our main person doing this, uh, and Finito's in Singapore. So uh, we built a, 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 a way on the web that people can go and fill in information from a variety of categories about how they're doing. And the web-based program tells them how what they're doing at completing that. We did the, the first one of the studies we did using this kind of measurement. We did at Armstrong School and we had a 28% completion rate by the end of the year. It fell off a lot during the summer, but it was hard to get people to complete it. Now that we have these little measures and administ the administrative people above the teachers or working with the parents can see how they're doing, they can feed back to them, you know, you're a little behind in filling these forms out, and they're doing a better job. At each school we've gone to, we've talked to the, to the teachers and to the parents, but more to the teachers about what do you consider most important? What do you think we should be measuring? What matters to you? And we use some gold standard measures like the Vanderbilt ADHD rating scale or the strengths and difficulties or the school anxiety scale. But the, parent, the, the teachers wanted to make up their own grit and resilience scale. And they wanted to make up their own academic progress scale. And we found that at each of the schools that they'd say, you know, some of these standard kinds of things are of value but there are some questions that we think are unique to what we do and to our way of approaching things, and we want to measure how we're doing on those. So those all go into it. Then we have a meeting with the parents, and we have a meeting with the teachers, where we share the phenotype, say this is what we think is the subtype, the way your child is learning. What, then talk about what we think is the target, what kind of an intervention do we want to be making. 
and what, how, how might that intervention be different than what we're doing right now. And then we try and identify the outcome measures that we're using that we think are going to change and try to work with the teachers to say, can we do a different kind of way of working together? Just as a quick example, here's the academic progress scale. And you can see how on certain things like math and science, reading and writing, expressive and receptive languages, kids went up and down. The thing that we found interesting was on Scales where we ask both parents and teachers to fill it out. Um, the, the teachers rated the child's performance as much improved, whereas the parents sometimes even rated it as not as good or that it's falling off. We think that it has something to do with uh, kids working in school, coming home, being tired, maybe not showing the written resilience, not showing some of the other things that they're showing at school. And we think it's a great opportunity for us to bring teachers and parents together to understand better where a child is growing and making progress and where not. So we're going to talk about how we might think about making interventions based on a larger school-based model and then a little more on more individuals for the child. And, and we'll open it up for discussion. So it's back to Stephanie. Okay. Oh, great. So I'll just talk a bit more about some of the research that we do with schools. Um, and more of the socio-emotional domains. Um, so uh, it's kind of no secret that uh, students with LDs have some psychosocial difficulties. Uh, most often talked about our increased anxiety and depression. And so here I'm just going to present uh, some work on a project, which I'll describe in more detail. But um, essentially we have these students self-report their feelings and behaviors at the beginning of the year and at the end of the school year. Um, and so in comparing uh, the populations that we have, these are students with LDs compared to uh, students without LDs who are in their same school, um, across multiple schools. Um, they do show higher instances of anxiety and depression. Um, we also are kind of trying to look at a more nuanced view of these socio-emotional competencies. Um, and from that, we find that they have a lower sense of mastery so that is a concept that builds on self-efficacy to include uh, their ability to, or what they feel is their ability to affect change. And so they show this lower sense of mastery and also this lower growth mindset, um, which some of you may have heard of. It's Carol Dweck's work, uh, essentially the belief that intelligence can be changed. So they are less likely than someone without a learning disability or learning difference to believe that their intelligence can be changed. Um, so not only do we find these um, replicated results of higher anxiety and depression, but this kind of more nuanced view uh, that they also have kind of a lower uh, sense in some of these other domains. And so um, we kind of wanted to look a little bit under the hood at what was going on. Um, and we decided to focus a bit on uh, attentional bias. And so attentional bias is um, a predisposition of our attention to process certain types of information rather than others. And so it's been used a lot in the anxiety literature um, where people show attention uh, preferentially toward or away from negative stimuli um, over neutral or positive stimuli. Um, and there's a lot of kind of information processing models on attentional bias uh, and how that contributes to cognition and behavior. Um, but the simple view that we kind of have here is that um, you can show attention to threat or hypervigilance. Um, and that's kind of the first stage um, automatic threat detection facilitated by the amygdala. Um, and then uh, perhaps at longer times, uh, you can show this shift away and attention avoidance of threat. Uh, which is uh, more of a top-down strategy, um, perhaps engaging the prefrontal cortex. Um, and so in the lab, you kind of see these attentional biases, um, attention to threat at shorter times, um, exposing someone to a picture or a word that is threatening, um, and then avoidance of threat at longer exposure times. And so the task that can kind of capture this attentional bias is called the dot probe task. Um, it was developed in 1986. Um, I think a year ago, uh, Danny Pine gave a Grand Rounds talk, and he talked a lot about this paradigm. Uh, so it captures attentional bias uh, by showing the participant two images. One is threatening uh, images or words. So one is threatening and one is neutral. 
uh, and then in place of one of those threatening images or words appears a probe, and the participant is instructed to respond to the probe as quickly as they can uh, when they see it. And so it captures attentional bias because the idea behind this is participants will respond faster to probes uh, when they replace the threatening image if they were looking at that. So. Uh, or versus the neutral image if they were looking at that. So by kind of looking across multiple trials at their response time from when the probe replaces a threatening stimulus versus a neutral stimulus, uh, you can kind of see whether they're showing this attentional bias one way or the other toward or away threatening information. And so this is what we kind of wanted to use um, to see if uh, students with LDs show an attentional bias with threat. So this task has been used uh, with children with autism, Williams syndrome, Turner syndrome, all types of anxieties, but hadn't been done in students with LDs, and so we wanted to see. And we're specifically interested in what content evokes an attentional bias. And so um, this task, for instance, was used in children with asthma, and they showed that these children show this attentional bias to asthma-related stimuli and words. And so to develop the task, we used a linguistic one, or a task with words, um, and we had three conditions. So the first one was physical threat words. Um, some examples are listed there. Um, that's typically used in uh, paradigms with general anxiety. Uh, social stereotype threat words. Um, that second category actually took uh, quite a bit of time of piloting to see what these students thought were the stereotypes surrounding LDs and what other people thought. Um, and then the third category is academic uh, with a specific focus on reading uh, threat-related words. And the interesting thing about this category is when you look at the valence database of words, uh, these words are actually technically rated as neutral and not threatening. Uh, but we were curious to see if they would evoke an attentional bias. And so um, all these threatening words are matched to neutral words on linguistic properties. Um, and then we recruited two groups of students, uh, students with LD and uh, students without LD matched on age and vocabulary level. And so the first thing we look at is just uh, looking at the group separately. Do they show an attentional bias in these conditions? Um, and neither showed um, any bias with the threat, uh, physical threat condition or the social stereotype threat condition. Um, the LD group showed a significant avoidance of reading related or academic words. Um, and there was a significant group difference. Um, and we threw in a bunch of covariates like word reading level, vocabulary, uh, and this group difference still emerged. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, Clearly this academic content is uh, more salient or students with LD are more sensitive to it and showing this attentional bias. Um, we can't kind of tell this with their current paradigm, but from other eye tracking studies that have been done, avoidance might be an anxiety reduction strategy for an initial vigilance to threat. Um, and overall what this kind of means is that um, they're showing this attentional bias with academic and reading threat words. And so, um, this kind of hints at potential negative cognitive reactions to academics uh, that need to be addressed in the classroom because it's not something um, uh, like spiders or snakes, like you have to face uh, these academic stimuli every single day in the classroom environment. And so it's important to focus on making the classroom environment more supportive. Uh, so I wanted to talk a bit about um, an organization that we work with um, that we think does a good job at this. Um, this project is sponsored by the Oak Foundation, um, and this organization is eye to eye that kind of sees uh, what I was talking about with the socio-emotional difficulties in LD and tries to address it um, by creating more supportive classrooms. And so how they do this is through what they call a near-peer mentoring model. And so uh, they are in 120 middle schools across the country, and they bring in college students who um, have similar labels, so they also have learning differences. Um, they participate in an arts-based curriculum on a weekly basis in school, typically during the students' study halls. Uh, and so what this looks like is they're asked to create an art project every week, um, that kind of pertains to some lesson uh, revolving around self-advocacy or self-concept. So an example of a project that I observed was they were asked to create their ideal learning environment. Uh, and so this is a picture of one of them. Um, 
there were students who put foam up on the walls because they said, um, I get easily distracted and I would like for the foam to absorb all the extra noise. Um, this student put a tree in the middle because he said he needs windows and likes to look outside while he's thinking about things. Uh, so these students are creating these art projects and then kind of led through a discussion on uh, what this means for them or how they can kind of advocate for themselves in the classroom. Meanwhile, they're also gaining these connections with mentors who are like them and who are in college um, and gaining kind of a support system within their schools. Uh, so what we do in partnering with this organization is uh, research on kind of where they're making impact or how they're making impact. And so um, after the first uh, year, um, and kind of pre and post looking at um, how the students self-report, they showed increases in their comfort with their LD and also decreases in emotional reactivity. Uh, so emotional reactivity, those questions asked a lot about um, when you become upset, are you able to calm down? Um, so kind of emotion regulation strategies there. And this year, so this is obviously not with a control group, but uh, this year we also have students from neighboring schools who don't have the program in their schools but have LDs, and we're looking at them pre and post uh, just to make sure that it's truly the program and not some other aspect of the school district that's kind of having this impact. But these results are certainly promising. Um, and so just kind of looking at uh, some of these things a little bit further, um, we found that emotional reactivity uh, in this population moderates between the relationship between the comfort with their LD and self-esteem. And so basically what that means is um, what you can kind of see on the graph is that your self-esteem is high if you're more comfortable with your LD, even if you have poor emotion regulation. Um, self-esteem is high if you have good regulation skills, even if you have low LD comfort. Um, and so the nuances of this relationship aren't as important. Um, but I think the overall message here is that there's no kind of one magic ingredient uh, in the recipe for success in all of these um, hundreds of socio-emotional competencies. It's important to focus on uh, kind of strengthening m multiple aspects in these programs. And so in looking at eye to eye as an example of promoting um, resilience and success in schools for LD students, um, they provide social support and role models and really increase connection in schools. Um, they reduce stereotype threat. Um, I know last week they did a lesson on strikeout stigma, and so they wrote all the stereotypes on bowling pins, and then they created their own bowling ball of tools they could use um, when someone confronts them with a stigma, and then they, we played a big bowling game. Uh, so in that way, they're kind of reducing the stereotype threat or stigma, which as we know from other fields, increases learning. Uh, they promote a growth mindset. Um, they have them often identify their strengths, increasing their confidence. Um, and teaching them, uh, as we saw in our results, the biggest change in these kind of emotion regulation strategies or reappraisal strategies. Uh, and so this is um, from a paper that we have, and essentially it was a review paper looking at um, all of these different protective factors um, in promoting both socio-emotional and cognitive resilience. So we talked a bit about the neuropsychology. Um, and these are kind of two separate fields for now, talking about the neuropsychology of LD versus the socio-emotional resilience of LD. Um, but we're trying to kind of conceptualize them as both feeding off one another. Um, if you are feeling more confident and comfortable in school, uh, you might read more, um, thereby increasing your cognitive skills and vice versa. So uh, this slide is just to show that literacy interventions, cognitive skills training, and supportive classrooms are all kind of important to focus on for the ultimate outcome um, in schools. And so now I believe we'll talk a bit about some co-occurring disorders, Dr. Hendren will, um, and also more at the individual level of treating anxiety in these co-occurring conditions. So just surveying how much comorbidity are we aware of uh, in uh, reading and learning disorders, we can see that there are many more depressive symptoms. Uh, anxiety symptoms are much higher. There's more suicides. Uh, aggressive and delinquent behaviors are higher. There's a study going on now that Mary Lou has been leading 
at a correctional facility looking at the amount of learning and reading disorders among people in those facilities and if any of you've worked in juvenile justice facilities it's just at least half the kids but, but mostly more uh, they're more much more likely to be arrested uh, and um, the counseling for their low self-esteem might be more common, but still not as much as people might think they could need or benefit from. The two biggest things that are kind of um, co-occurring or happen at the same time are anxiety, and the other is ADHD. And this sense uh, as somebody who has if you have dyslexia and you're having a difficult time learning to read, this anticipation of failure, that people are going to notice that you do that, teacher's going to call on you to come up and read. Gavin Newsom, who uh, you might recall is the mayor of uh, Sacramento, but is our honorary board chair, of uh, mayor of San Francisco, uh, our honorary board chair, tells stories of how he would memorize what he knew he was going to have to read. and then get up in front of the class and he'd hold the book, but he would be telling what he knew from memory. And he talks about other strategies that you hear kids that have dyslexia talk about what they do in order to try and cover up, but underneath all of it, they feel like they're fake or they're not real or they could be discovered. And that leads them to feel anxiety about that happening to them and to feel as though they uh, are then increasingly depressed. They also get angry a little bit more. Their parents can be targets of that anger. When I give this talk to parents at uh, schools for kids with uh, dyslexia, the parents are, are often asking, you know, my kid gets so mad at me. He does okay at school. He doesn't get mad at everybody else, but he comes home and takes it out on me. And I think we can all give them a, a good explanation, but and they probably know in their hearts too, but they know that the parents can be trusted a bit more. And, uh, uh, but it can also lead them to be somewhat overprotective. They, at times, will try to um, uh, help the child do better, feeling they have a disability, and then sometimes protect them more than might be needed, and they have then greater difficulties as they get into adolescence. They, um, again, have difficulty with self-esteem and negative thoughts, and this leads to family stress that goes on. So these are kids that are often hypervigilant, reactive to novel stimuli. They cope by avoidance. They don't want to go places where they might get discovered by their parent, parental over accommodation and overprotection. It may also, as we know with all anxiety disorders, show up in physical symptoms that might either be ways of avoiding or might be ways that the body is somatizing. Then their inattention and poor performance might not be just ADHD, it might be their anxiety that's leading to that stress and strain as well. and becomes most noticeable between 6 and 12, but seems to continue on throughout a lifetime. Uh, people will tell you that experienced dyslexia when they were a kid will tell heart-wrenching stories, and we'll talk about what it means to them. You see some people that really rise above it, and people, there was a doctoral dissertation done on how many entrepreneurs were people that had dyslexia. Um, and for the real smart ones, and the resourceful ones, and the ones that use that as a way to kind of, with their grit and resilience, overcome things, that's great. But if you're of average intelligence, or a bit below, and you're having trouble learning to read, it's hard to find the silver lining to that cloud for a lot of kids that are struggling as they go along. And it continues then to be a certain issue for them. But there's a whole list of people with uh, dyslexia that are kind of famous, like Charles Schwab has given us over a million dollars for the research we're doing, and we're really grateful to him for that. But he, I think, feels he especially likes that what we're doing is translational. He felt that when he had given money before, it went to research that was laboratory research, or it went to just delivering services. And he wanted somebody that would look at research and show how it was translated into, the, in, into a, some real world setting where it could make a difference. Um, the, um, about 20% of those kids that have a lot of anxiety can go on to another 20% develop depression that becomes a concern for dyslexia. 
uh, and that these intense <coughs> symptoms at the beginning of anxiety may diminish, but as kids grow older, that's still there and there are still triggers that can lead to that coming up again. Um, they may be bi-directional. The, the anxiety interferes with the learning process. The learning process uh, adds to the anxiety and it kind of goes back and forth. There's also some studies indicating that there may be a stronger family history of anxiety disorders in kids with dyslexia and that that anxiety from the parents somehow gets wrapped up in the kids' anxiety about their own dyslexia as well. That's not totally 100% uh, foundational, but at least it does seem to hold true for some, some families and some parents. Um, the co-occurrence with ADHD occurs between uh, 40 and 60 percent. I say here 15 to 45, but I read just the other day somebody saying they thought that it was higher than that. And I, anyway, it's a significant number. And I think for many of us in psychiatry, we may see a child and find out they're having trouble with their attention and think they have ADHD, but we don't ask the rest of the questions about their difficulties in learning or their difficulties in reading, just as the other side of that is true. And I find, as I see more and more kids with this kind of co-occurring disorder, I find some of them are having a heck of a time learning to read, and I, I take a careful history and I think, oh, it looks like they have ADHD, treat them with stimulants. They read. And I have, there are a number of families that were planning to put their kid in, a, in one of the schools for dyslexia, some that have kids going to school for dyslexia, and within uh, a few months to a year, they're out and doing pretty well with their ADHD having been treated. But I see almost an equal number of kids that um, are having, uh, it seems, trouble in school. And those are kids that didn't come to me as a child psychiatrist, but come to us because of our research in dyslexia. And I think um, for some of those, it's the other way around, too. That the, the ADHD led to their having difficulty in reading on the one way or on the other way. It's the dyslexia making them look like they had trouble with attention. But they're kind of spacing out. They're not paying attention in class. They're looking out the window in part because they can't read and keep up with the other kids. It impacts a number of areas uh, throughout the lifetime. We think of it academically with children but we're finding adolescents in terms of accidents and injuries and in adults, legal difficulties, divorce, and occupational and vocational difficulties from this ADHD, especially if it's comorbid. So I think all of us are in settings where we can make a difference with this kind of an understanding. Uh, your patient attends school, you will be thinking about, you know, how are they doing, what difficulties might they be experiencing. You might be asked to make a consultation in a system of care or in a school-centered kind of case discussion. And John uh, said to Fumiko and to me when giving this grand rounds, he said, we don't have enough on school consultation, so make sure you talk about school consultation. And I appreciated his uh, warm introduction as well, but I'm, this is my uh, response, or at least trying to say we're going to talk a little. And I think it may be well known to some of you, but it may not be well known to everyone. There's also direct service that we can give in a variety of settings. And I think more and more, it's just great when mental health professionals can find their ways into working in schools. And some school districts employ people that are, you know, some of you know Steve Adelsheim is a, now at Stanford, but he was in New Mexico when I was there as a resident. And, uh, someone from family practice opened a school-based clinic and he said well to us would, would you put child psychiatry in this clinic steve as a resident said as a fellow he said okay i'll do that i think that's a good idea he started doing that but that grew on to where he had a full-time job working for the department of education and traveling around new mexico <coughs> giving consultation to schools about both the system and about individual children and i think the more we can find our way in to be able to do that as mental health professionals, the better I think it can be. <coughs> so a successful consultative relationship strengthens relationships, finds a way to go in and think, how do I build a better school? And I think some of the things that Stephanie talked about really um, began to address that because the socio-emotional part of these kids uh, is helped a lot when they're treated <coughs> with compassion. 
it fosters recognition of the dynamic forces, the ways of understanding these difficulties that kids are having, and facilitate uh, responses, looking at uh, different kinds of skills, appealing to shared values, and trying to improve their development. There are a number of ways that we can give behavioral interventions, and I won't read each of these things, and if somebody's interested in the slide set, I think we're both willing to share it, right? So we'd be happy to do that, but some of the things that have just been garnered over the years are things that are helpful for those of us working with kids in schools are thinking about behavioral interventions, like um, appropriate verbal exchanges, removing from the situation until control is achieved, uh, dealing with frustration, uh, uh, teach perspective taking, uh, thinking about how to make consequences meaningful, all of those things are important skills for us to have. There's also ways that I think as child mental health people, our reports have a tremendous amount of power in the school. And so if we can give recommendations uh, to the teachers, it can make a difference, like extending time for assignments. Sometimes that's become like therapy dogs, you know? Everybody uses that, so everybody needs extended time for their assignments, just like everybody wants to take their pet on the plane. And so they get some doctor to write something out. But there are some times that it is so useful and makes such a difference for kids that if they just have that little longer period of time, reducing the volume of assignments, breaking long assignments into chunking it. Some of these kids, as we talked about that phonological loop, have a hard time chunking their information and somebody needs to help them do that. All of those, these are things that can go into a report and can be very useful for kids that are having these kinds of difficulties. It's important that the pharmacologic treatment that we might think of that involves anxiety or ADHD type interventions or depression be managed along with the parents and the, the teachers. I've found increasingly as we go into schools, being able to talk to teachers about what we expect from the medication, what we think um, might be a side effect, what we're hoping to see as an improvement makes uh, just a world of difference. Bennett and Youngshin and uh, Whitney and I went to one of the schools where we consult to yesterday and started talking to the, some of the teachers about a kid that I think really had a lot of difficulty with attention and uh, the opportunity to be there and you know they were all like no no not the medication not the ADHD drug uh, it made such a difference if you can begin to form a relationship with people and be able to share that in ways that are useful. Uh, for thinking about anxiety disorders, I don't feel like we probably get enough training. I know that I have not as a child psychiatrist and still don't. In thinking about how can you treat anxiety without necessarily thinking of a medication. But things like positive reframing, thought challenging, using some of the CBT type techniques that uh, we're increasingly appreciating. And then uh, thinking about helping people define some of the issues in their life, looking at this de-stress model that talks about what's the situation where you feel anxious, how are you educating them what they do, speculate about what that might mean, how they can do things differently, practice uh, also getting exercise and thinking of how to strategize. Things too like yoga, mindfulness, meditation, uh, feedback and exercise are also useful ways to help people learn to manage their anxiety. So. We're going to have about 10 minutes left. A quick summary that Stephanie and I worked together for one second. Um, uh, that LD and dyslexia are often accompanied by socio-emotional challenges and anxieties or comorbidities. Schools play a role in addressing this uh, by finding out a supportive uh, classroom and child mental health professionals can provide individual attention through appreciating this coexistence. So, person who had his hand up first goes for the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much uh, for this inspired uh, summary of interventions. It made me think about uh, Shaywitz's work maybe 10 years ago at Yale. Uh, and my recollection was that she had documented the folks, the kids, the students with dyslexia were essentially using the brain centers of a beginning reader. And that with targeted interventions, uh, she documented, I think with PET scans, that uh, they then 
uh, actually mitigated their dyslexia and uh, started using brain centers that experienced and rapid fast readers would use. Uh, so that to me, uh, in the endless discussion of nature versus nurture, uh, strongly suggested uh, that there's a very significant benefit from targeted interventions uh, and that the concept of a disability which we tend to see as something static, uh, was not helpful at all. And yeah, again, along good. those same lines, uh, you know this country has the highest rate of ADHD of any place in the world. Uh, and no one has a clear answer for that. And no one knows why Japan, China, rates are a third. Um, you know, so again, if you suggest reducing the volume of assignments, that would not be characteristic of a Chinese, Korean, <laughs> or Japanese family. You know, they would say, time to sit down and do more work. Well, there's a whole bunch of good points in what you said. I think the Shaywitz memory is that they did show that they, they looked like beginning readers. And, as they, and, and for all of us, we look like beginning readers when we read. And as we get better, then different brain circuits take over so they don't have to work as hard. And for these kids that have dyslexia, they're having to work very, very hard. Um, there are some kids that we think do well with the remediation, and sometimes we think they do better with accommodation. So there's, uh, there have been a few kids that when we've gone to a case conference, we might say, you know, this kid is not ever going to really learn to read well and easily in the way that, you know, would be looking at the phonics, reading something. So maybe they need to use books on tape, or maybe they need to use uh, further writing, they need to have a computer, and there are other ways, and yet it makes it harder for them to get on if they uh, can't do all those things, but there comes a point after a time where we've sometimes said, at least at this point, we're not sure that it's worth the effort to try and have them learn to do all of this. My understanding on ADHD was they did a a good study of Chinese school children and they found the incidence of ADHD was the same as in the US if they used DSM criteria and went through saying, you know, do you meet that criteria? But if we were going to talk about how many of them get treatment, how many get identified, how many get labeled that, then it's way, way, way down. America is just hugely different in their use of the medications and treatment for that. So I think that's been used by Bob, is you you make a powerful point about comorbidity with ADHD and anxiety disorders. When you look at uh, Mary Lou's subtypes, or do the comorbidity vary among subtypes? And if so, does it, how does the treatment get targeted differently? Um, I don't think we've gotten to the point that I can say, I can answer that with any confidence. But as you know, we're trying to start a phenotyping project for ADHD, and it's based on two or three of those um, phenotypes that she has for dyslexia saying, you know, there's one where you have uh, a, an immediate attention problem, there's another where you have trouble holding something in mind that's working memory and is not necessarily an ADHD type thing. There's some too where it may be even because you have trouble with auditory discrimination, you space out because you're not, those words aren't getting processed. And I think that's what we're wanting to think more about and understand it because I think all of us have kids with ADHD that don't respond the way we think they should. So does the same apply to anxiety disorders? Is there variability there as well amongst the, the subtypes of dyslexia? I think that's a great question, but I don't know the answer. And since we only have a little over 50 kids at this point, we don't have enough to break that down, but I'm really looking forward to when we can. Good questions. Tom? I was struck by your threat uh, tests that the physical and socio-emotional threats didn't have an effect, only the really recoverable. Why do you think the socio-emotional didn't have an effect? I would have yeah. expected them to have a, a difference. Yes, and one thing um, with that sample is they did have higher anxiety too. I think um, there's a couple of reasons why that might be. Um, one, uh, just full disclosure, so the LD students in that study, sorry, uh, the LD students in that study actually came all from private LD schools, and most of them have been there 
um, from elementary to middle school, and they receive daily almost um, therapies for their anxiety. So I think that while they still show this greater anxiety, it's remediated to an extent in that population. Um, I would be really curious to kind of do the same thing in public school students who aren't in those really uh, supportive classroom environments to see if um, the anxiety is a little bit more prevalent and thus the kind of bias to threats that's seen in anxiety is more prevalent. So that's kind of my hypothesis on that. Yeah, with the bias, the intentional bias to threat, are you scanning them in the MRI scanner also? Not yet. <laughs> no, we aren't. Not, not for that one. Not yet. Yeah. I think I just bombed the great talk. Um, you know, if I remember correctly, I, mean, I remember like a year ago from Nico, maybe it's longer than that, gave a talk on dyslexia, and what I recall was that she said, you really have to intervene very, very early to make a, a large change in dyslexia. And it, to be able, if I remember, it was like five, six, seven years old. It's pretty young, younger. younger than that. So is it is it really is it really precipitously drop off sort of exponentially? Even if you were like in a meeting like eight, nine, ten, is it really like you have to get to them like four, five, six years old? Is that, uh, I think we're increasingly appreciating that the difficulties that people have with dyslexia don't start when they're just trying to learn to read. Yeah. There there's ways that their brains work, and a lot of the parents that we talk to will say, Oh yeah, I, I knew there was something different about his way of learning and doing things when he was three or even before then. And uh, I think what uh, Fumiko and Stephanie and the group are really working on are getting an app that can identify these kids early. I don't know if you want to say more about that, but the, um, <coughs> the and Fumiko is getting grand rounds in a month. Yes, on the, the uh, 21st of February. And that's why when I said we're a three-part part of the Dyslexia Center, uh, Stephanie did part of that, the socio-emotional, but Fumiko will do more in talking. And we just think it's so essential. And right now, there's a huge foundation that, uh, is, that they're kind of starting to dance together that say, you know, this could be uh, <clears throat> really international in what's being done. So I think people appreciate that, that if the intervention has to be done early. Yeah, Linda. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. The part that um, I was wondering about, I'm interested in, is the kind of comorbidity and the comorbidity between ADHD and, say, RD or anxiety and RD. Um, but then also the role of psychosocial versus RD or you know, academic skills focused interventions. And whether you're thinking that those interventions might be interacting in some capacity. So if you provide psychosocial, will that improve the uptake of the academic skills intervention um, or not? And I was reminded of a paper that maybe was published about a year ago looking at ADHD and RD. And they found direct effects of the ADHD intervention and the RD intervention, but not in interaction. So they are, you know, each are effective mm -hmm. in approaching their like, you know, the sort of targeted outcomes, but there's not a benefit an added benefit to the ADHD behavioral kind of intervention. I actually think medication was included as well um, on um, academic skills outcomes. And we do know behavioral interventions have a tough go of it trying to make any movement on academic skills per se. It's a great way. Uh, it, I, I think it's it's intriguing that there was no interaction, um, uh, but I do I think that for the schools and we work now or have visited uh, six or eight different uh, LD schools in the community and all of them focus a lot on this trying to build the kids' sense of self worth, their ability to be assertive and to talk about what they need. The, a whole lot of things like that that aren't just learning how to read. It's how to be as a, a person that helps them deal with their difficulty learning how to read. And their self-esteem gets better. It seems like they learn better. They go back to public schools. They do OK, but they have been just really beaten down in their first year or two in that public school setting. So I do think it's, it, it's that whole package that needs to go together. So we'll just gave me the high sign, and uh, we're out of here. Thank you all. Thank you.